and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which digs just a little deeper into the minds behind the best of the food books through four food moments. This week, it's all about the food programme. Not just Radio 4's mighty series, which has been examining our food, its culture and its politics for 43 years, but its brand new BBC book by Alex Renton, taking us through 13 foods which shape our world. You know, I've been a fan of the programme all my life. And that kind of journalism that seeks to inform, entertain, you know, add add joy to your life which food should bring and go deep into why we eat and how we eat. Sheila Dillon, presenter of the food programme for much of that time, has written the foreword. We first met back in 2017 for the delicious podcast when the food programme was under threat from Radio 4. A mass outpouring of love for the show, new presenters and now a book are just some of the results of that enforced rethink. Before we chat to Alex about his four food moments from the Food Programme book, Sheila reveals her own existential pondering and a surprising fragility considering her role as doyenne of food in Britain. We began by going back to the moment she heard the show for the first time. I'd been working at this rather political food magazine in New York, you know, that sort of looked at all aspects of food, but but really, you know, sort of the world, development, um, food corporations. I wrote a column called Food Biz, which you know looked at all the financial journalism about food, and um, oh, came back to Britain. And then I heard this program, Derek Cooper. I mean, I didn't, I'd never heard of the food program. You know, this rich voice came over the airwaves, and he was in France. It was some sort of meeting between the winemakers of I don't remember what area of France, and the British consul for that area and the, the the British consul was supposedly bringing great cheeses from Britain anyway the cheeses hadn't turned up and what they had was a dyed yellow cheddar as as Derek Cooper called it from some you know from I don't know Dairy Lee or something and it was wonderful because Her Majesty's representative was taken aback by Derek's you know, very polite, maybe, you know, comments that maybe this was not, these were not the finest products of the British Isles. You know, Derek conveyed the difference between a, a culture where food was embedded and was seen as a, as a great pleasure, but also as part of life, and Britain, where food was seen as, you know, it's just a trivial add-on. And I thought, by gum, <laughs> or something of the sort. You know, I've never done radio, and I've never even thought about it. But I thought, you know, there's someone I'd eat somewhere I'd love to work. And the programme then didn't go into the economic underpinnings of the food system quite as much as it has in the years since. But it was, it was remarkable, and it was the only, honestly, the only thing at the time that was taking food mm-hmm. seriously. Yeah. You talk about um, Derek Cooper being one of those Bollinger Bolsheviks last time we chatted, you know, bolly for all. And it really kind of underpinned Mm. that kind of the culture of the food programme, that there was this wonderful world of food. But you were a much more radical journalist, weren't you? You have a real sort of sense of always had a real sense of social justice. And that's what you brought to really exploring what the food industry was all about. Would you say that you kind of changed the culture of it? It sounds immodest, doesn't it? But uh, yes, I think I did. I think we were a good match, Derek Cooper and I, because, you know, we used to write what we called the the hymn sheet. And sometimes, you know, if we had a program that delved into the financial elements of the food system, you know, he, he would say, you know, I, oh, shit, I don't, you know, I'm never going to grasp this. He was this, as you say, Bollinger Bolshevik. You know, he came from a working class background just the same way I did. And he had a sense that it should be good bread for all, good cheese for all, that, you know, there ought not to be two food systems, you know, one for the poor and one for, every, you know, people with money. So we, you know, we worked together really well. And, um, you know, I learned an enormous amount from him because I was more of a ranty person, you know, being involved in feminist politics. But it was at a time when the supermarkets were really beginning to change everything. So 1979 was the first food programme, and it was really the 1980s that the supermarket changed, not just what we eat, but the way we eat. And that's where 
the politics comes in, doesn't it? I mean, you say in the foreword to Alex Renton's book, which we'll talk about in a minute, that there are only four supermarkets dominating our entire food culture, everything along the food system from the production through distribution through to the way we eat. And that's your bit, isn't it? Um, you know, Derek Cooper comes with that sort of idea that it, good food should be available to everybody. Great. That's what the supermarkets also wanted. But in doing so, in delivering that promise, it unhinged the entire food system. Is that a good way of looking at the last 40 years? Well, yes, I think it is. It is a good way of looking at it in the UK. The, the bigger context is, you know, what that happened to the retail food system. But then you were having a globalised food system behind that in food manufacture and, you know, food sourcing. But but yes, it did. And and the way it fitted into um, the, the Thatcher era where, you know, this privatisation of everything, um, school meals, you know, that it's it, it, like the cost of everything. You know, we, we, we decided that the cost of everything was, that was the prime thing. It, you know, there didn't seem to be an understanding that if you totally screwed up school meals, there might be bigger effects than parents having to pay less. Um, and, you know, and the price of all those things is really has... You know, we, we're aware of the price we've ha we've paid for all that. Yeah, absolutely. Despite the sort of the, the, the real f core of the food programme being about social justice, it did come under fire. Uh, when we talked last time, you know, there was a real anxiety about its future. Um, the food programme had to be put out to tender and there were lots of indies coming in with their new sort of millennials and they kind of, you know, the Radio 4 seemed very middle class and very out of touch and the food program had to really pitch itself for its own slot a lot of food writers me included um, and a lot of food fans wrote to the BBC and demanded that the food program <laughs> keep its slot and and we're very pleased it has but you did take on some younger people uh Jager Wise and Leila Kazim have changed the the kind of the spirit of the food program how does it feel now after that existential crisis uh which made you rethink the whole thing uh not just you but your producers obviously how does it feel now well, it feels good. I mean, I, I think Jaeger and Layla are a fantastic addition to the program. I mean, it's more all-encompassing now. I feel no apology for the way the food program was before. Um, Radio 4 was going through a process. It wasn't just the food program that had to justify itself. But I think it, it was really good for us to think because, you know, Dan Saladino had been there, you know, quite a long time. Dan is a serious journalist. And it was, it was good to question what we were doing, who we were reaching, were we singing to the choir? And Jaga and Layla have added enormously to that. And during lockdown, we haven't met that much, but our food program meetings online, you know, they just, it's refreshing. It forces me to consider, you know, our audience. I mean, we thought we did before, but I think we're much better at it now. And, you know, like last week's programme with Layla interviewing Jack Monroe, you know, bootstrap cook. You know, Layla was really the right person yeah. to do that. And it's Layla's programme that has been shortlisted for Fortnum and Mason's this year. Yes. I mean, I, I have to say that, you know, MSG didn't interest me the tiniest bit. I would never have yeah. done that programme. Yes, I mean, every, on every board, on every panel, in every corner of the world, it's always better to have a diverse group of people. Of course it is. Mm. And you argue and you toss ideas around, which is what we do in our you know, food programme meeting. The book, The, the Food Programme, 13 Foods That, have, that Shape Our World uh, by Alex Renton. Did that come out of this big rethink about what the food programme is and to whom? I think, frankly, it came more out of um, Radio 4's rethink um, about, you know, how they could um, value and, and, and expand the audience already committed to um, the, the broadcast and the podcast. You know, I knew Dan was working on a book, Eating to Extinction, that I thought was really fascinating. And, you know, you've had him on Cooking the Books. And this just seemed to me, yeah, fine. You know, Radio 4 came to us, came to the programme and said, 
you know, we want a food program book. You know, I knew Alex Renton. Um, I mean, in recent times, he's written more about his family and his own experience. But, you know, he's a very, as you know, a, you know, really good food journalist. So the book was a sort of conjunction of the food program, of us, the team, thinking, OK, um, yes, um, let's have a food program book. And Dan didn't, you know, Dan was busy. I didn't want to write it. And we thought, you know, wouldn't Alex be great? Yes. I mean, it feels to me like a, a sort of a whisk through the most important issues around food in the world. You know, we go from uh, sugar and slavery. Uh, we go into the politics of uh, bread and cocoa and tomatoes. I mean, it is 13 staples that that change our world and I've just done an, uh, a wonderful interview with Eleanor Ford who wrote The Nutmeg Trial for example and that's a deep dive into spice um, whereas this is a chapter on spice amongst the others and I wondered if it was an entry point for new people younger people perhaps yeah no I actually of course I think that's exactly what it is it's to say you know isn't food interesting <laughs> Precisely, Julie. Isn't food interesting? When, when Alex and I first talked, when this was commissioned, I said, you have to read Carolyn Steele. You know, you have to read Zootopia. The food-shaped world, you know, that we all pretend that food is somehow there like the air we breathe. And, you know, we don't have to consider it. And what I loved during that little bit of freedom during lockdown is that we made an almost sci-fi version of the of the food one program of my favorite where, programs. You know, we we moved to the future, and I was interviewing um, Prime Minister Carolyn Steele. You know, there'd been riots and and chaos, and and she'd suddenly at the head of the Zootopia party, she was a prime minister, and my you know kitchen turned out to be um, the greenhouse in um, in <laughs> at number ten. Uh, but that program, you know, it was it captured that, and I and and I think thirteen foods that shape the world, you know, it sort of comes out of that, and and I think Alex was inspired by by Carolyn as well as by yeah. the food program. You know, we had to. How do you boil down forty odd years of the food program into thirteen foods? You know, we've Alex has captured so many of the issues well I think so you know you've you know you have a I don't know what do you think I think that this is a great book to have in your shelf if you don't know very much about food um you know you mentioned Carolyn Steele I interviewed her again recently uh for the right to food and she we were talking about food hubs and I you know I I asked her to be part of the program because of that vision that she'd kind of given uh of what could be possible and she had mentioned food hubs you know after Debenhams and top shops and river islands had all closed and there were the opportunities and there were the food hubs actually moving in there's the vision actually happening um and when I was talking to her about where we are now she was talking about dial up food you know she has a wonderful way of of sort of you know using words to express whole moments that have happened in history and I would love to see that kind of thing in a in a food program book, which is, you know, I mean, I wonder if there may be more people who have been listening to the food program for a long time may want to have a deep dive into some of those programs. So, you know, Layla, for example, did a wonderful program uh, recently for the food program about uh, those whizzy grocery bike things, you know, delivered to your door, dial up food, as Carolyn Steele calls it. I'd love to see a book about the changing face of deliveries, for example, you know, anything, anything like that. And why are you not writing it, Sheila? Your forward is absolutely jumping off the page. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> Julie, years of therapy have, um, <laughs> have followed from my asking that question. I'm the perfect person to work in radio where you have a short deadline and, you know, to write a script. I can't answer it, really. I mean, you know, I'm not joking about the therapy. You know, you go, oh, Michael Pollan, B. Wilson, um, Joanna Blythman, Felicity, Lawrence, they've written those books. Why would I write that book? Because we want to hear your voice, genuinely. I mean, you know, I talked to Dan about how difficult it was to find his voice when he was actually writing Eating to Extinction. He really struggled with that. He's been writing for radio for years, and yet he didn't know what his voice looked like on the page. 
And I think that that's the point, isn't it? Uh, but the utter joy when you do find that and can communicate with an audience that already loves you and wants listens to what you think all the time may well love to read your work. I certainly would, Sheila. <laughs> well, you're very nice, Jilly. Um, no, I agree. I mean, I, I know Dan struggled and, and he says now, you know, I don't know how I wrote that book. If you were to write, Sheila, I mean, you've clearly thought about it, uh, even if you are racked with anxiety at the very thought of it. What would you want to write? What would you want to say? You are in a prime position of being able to look back over an extraordinary period of food history. Yeah, I mean, that's what I want to write, that, um, that you know, the world changed and the world changed around food. And I was a journalist who was documenting it at the time. I know what it felt like. And that's what I would like to write, to say, look, you know, this is, this was the world, you know, that I grew up in, and it was fairly, a, you know, it seemed like a stable world. And then it all changed dramatically. And this is, this is, these were the change points. And, you know, I've been interested in, in doing it, you know, in terms of, a kind of memoir attached to a an account of something serious and you know that's how I've thought of of writing it because you know when you asked me that question in 2017 you know I I had a moment where I was you know I was a journalist I was in New York I was writing about um, feminist things I was writing for Condé Nast I was and then suddenly something happened and I you know I'd always been a greedy cook and liked food, and, you know, I grew up in the countryside, and, and then suddenly I just thought, bloody hell, you know, food really, really matters. Politically, it matters. It tells you about the world. And that's the sort of book I'd like to write, you know, but... <laughs> what would it take, <laughs> Sheila? Come on, give us a little glimpse of what you're finding out in therapy. <laughs> what would it take? Well, it, it requires me to be... You know, really, you know, I, you know what, you know, you've written, you know what it's like. It's very exposing. And then you think to yourself, Christ, what could be more exposing than talking on the radio (laughs) to, you know, nigh on two million people? Um, Except that, you know, I can, I can hide. And in a way, I feel what I'm writing, I can't hide in the same way. And that my... You know, I went to a, a wonderful course, about, you know, about life writing at Goldsmiths College. And, and you know, I got all this positive feedback, you know, because I was, you know, I was, I was trying to write what I've just told you about. But people say, you know, I was, it was, it, I wasn't angry enough. There wasn't enough anger in my writing. There wasn't enough deep emotion. You know, I was still hiding. Um, I don't know. I'll regret saying all this, Jilly. <laughs> <laughs> but couldn't you just pull back as you're, as a, you know, a, a, a radical journalist, that j- journalist who, you know, has always fought for the underdog, who's brought out those wonderful stories of the small producers. I mean, you know, Tim Davey, as you say in the foreword, calls the, the Food and Farming Awards, the stories of those small producers, the beating heart of the BBC. And it feels to me that it's the beating heart of Sheila Dillon too surely a beautiful book with your lovely radio voice running through it telling the story of all these extraordinary people and cut through with this sense of social justice and uh, the underdog against the corporations I'd love to read something like that how, how could that be exposing <sighs> Jilly I had no idea this would turn into a therapy <laughs> session <laughs> And I think one of the things that you could do apart from renting out your lovely house for yoga weekends is you could probably do writing therapy (laughs) workshops. No, I mean, you know, I'm surrounded by, you know, my friends write books and, you know, and anyway, yes, I'm trying. But, you know, I feel like it would be it would be death to the idea to keep to say, well, Julie, I am actually trying. But, you know, I am actually trying. Yeah. There, you see how tricky this business of writing really is. Happily, Alex Renton, a campaigning journalist whose work on poverty, development, the environment, food culture and food policy, made him the perfect candidate to write the book. I asked him how it felt to be asked. Just incredibly flattering. Really. I'm just so delighted. You know, I've been a fan of the programme all my life. And, I mean, and, and that kind of 
journalism that seeks to inform, entertain, you know, add add joy to your life, which food should bring, um, and, and and go deep into why we eat and how we eat. It's just the perfect job. I was so chuffed. I mean, we've talked about it as a sort of an entry point for people to get a whiz through all the politics of food over the last, well, God knows how many hundreds of years, but particularly how it affects the way we live now. Whisk me through those four main moments that have really kind of resonated for you. What did you really learn? Well, I think the key was, you know, as you know from the food programme, just how food has and remains intrinsic not not just to our daily lives but but also the whole world treats and uses food kind of in the same way for pleasure and for sustenance and that food will always be political uh, it's really very hard to get get out of that particularly now that politics and economics and the environment you know, have come together to to this crisis that we're facing and pulling it all together also you go in, and the food program you know has specialized in looking at this over the years is how you really can't trust big food industry you, you really have to go back to basics and remember what you know, our grandparents did and uh, and you know and take the promises of of the corporates with a big pinch of salt possibly not artisanal salt which the food program and i are not very convinced by but um well i mean take that and how does that apply to something like for example your first food moment is fats and oils croissants and butteries you say the lost and refound joy of animal fats i mean you know one of the big impacts of the the politics of food and farming is our relationship with animals and therefore animal fats is that why you chose that particular I think if fats and 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 oils. It's not the the most attractive chapter heading. It, it <laughs> turns out to be incredibly important. It, not least because it illustrates massive changes in in diet and and also some of the bad science that food industry has taken on. You know, I grew up uh, with margarine because it was healthier. Now it turns out that the margarine was made was possibly more dangerous than the butter that I enjoy today. Um, and. And butter and oils have always been a really good way of, uh, first of all, feeding us, giving us the essential, essential things we did in our diet, and plus things that we now understand like omega-3 and so on. Uh, and using animal fats has always been a good idea, um, uh, not just for our health, but also because it, it cut down on the waste. And then you take all that science, which we've now turned on its head and people have begun to understand again, they shouldn't be frightened of, of healthy, healthy animal fats and look at things we kind of ignored. It's just you know, the croissant. Great croissant is up to 40 percent butter. So is the, the buttery, um, the brilliant uh, snack that fishermen in the northeast of Scotland treasured. And we still treasure up here. We, I live up here today. And, and so running through those things and getting to the buttery recipe, which is kind of a, a northeast Scottish croissant, um, pulls all those stories together. So it, so it makes sense. The other thing about butter, which has always fascinated me, is a lot of this research um, tells you stories of women's labour uh, in making um, the manufactured products of food you know, before the industrialisation of them. That w women were the butter makers on the farms. Uh, there's an awful lot of this songs and lore and magic associated with butter and, and superstition. Uh, and w you know, women get bullied over the fact that the butter's gone, gone wrong or, has, or has, hasn't churned properly you know that is your second food moment and i love that and you talk about the the kind of the way that women have been seen as food producers uh over hundreds of years i was very interested in what you wrote about the dairy maid yes yeah, so, so dairy maid had, had this enormous um importance in britain is a society that was built on cheap protein for coming out of the dairies and then as the towns started to grow shipped into the towns by horse and cart and then on the trains and and this was traditionally women's work, and it might have been the farmer's wife or or employed um, employed local people. Uh, and and the dairy maids, uh, you know, this is labour that women get paid for a bit, like by like herring gutting was in the nineteenth century. But 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 also a, a trade which is very much controlled by the adult men who ran the farms. And and dairy maids you know, get, have a hard time. And um, the beauty of it is is also you realise this 
a culture of working women around it, the lovely, the rhymes that still exist that were specifically there to get the rhythms right when you were swinging the, the, but, the butter churn, the barrel. Come, butter, come, come, butter, come. Peter's standing at the gate waiting for a cake. Come, butter, come. And of course, but what they're doing is crucial labour because butter and cheese is how you turn milk into something that can be can travel, can be sold, can be preserved with salt and so on. So, so you, you, you monetize the cow and really do quite a lot in the shaping of the way rural England, rural Britain that we know um, looks today. Absolutely. It's a lovely picture um, of a time gone by. There was a lot of stuff in that particular chapter that I really loved and I didn't know. Um, your third food moment, whisking us across the world, um, cooking rice the way rice growers cook it much of the research i have to say it does come from the food program you do actually kind of reference it a lot uh it is very much a food program book but but tell us about what you learned about rice well that was a happy moment where where food program old food programs which i listened to a lot of which was a great joy it you yeah. came together with with my food journalist life I, I lived in asia for five years working for oxfam uh, on often on food and poverty and famine stories and and got very excited particularly going to to Cambodia, learning traditional ways of using rice and dealing with rice. And, and one of the things I realised now, which I think people are getting aware of, is that what we do with rice is kind of appalling to people, people who, who grow rice and eat it every single day. And there's a lovely bit of YouTube somewhere of a, of a Chinese chef I know going, going, and then you drain the water off the rice? What's that about? So I, I spent some time with a Thai, a Thai chef showing me exactly how he did it. And of course, the principle that you know, you, the rice should kind of boil dry and then it's ready. That way you retain all the goodness and, and the nutrients and the flavour. Um, it, well, it, it's always worth going back to the first people to use these, these things to find out, the, find out the best way of doing them. Always yeah. um, need enlightening. And that's a good food programme principle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, your final food moment is about the spices. Why did you pick this one out of the 13 staples that you, you go through in the book as one of your food moments? I mean, the chapter is called spice, but it's really heat. That's what we looked at most. And I think the editors went, but heat isn't a food. And you're going, well, it's pretty crucial. So I looked at the hot spices, um, you know, from pepper and chilli through to turmeric, um, really, because... It, as you know, you can write an entire book um, about nutmeg, and, and I didn't have the chance to do that. So I w was fascinated by what hot spice does to us chemically, why we've sorted out about the amazing way that a chili, you know, fa discovered in the well, discovered by Europe for Europeans in in the 1490s, gets all the way around the world in about 70 years, and then of course becomes known in Asian cuisine. But Sheila Dillon really, uh, and, and a program she made about turmeric really sparked me she, uh, Sheila uh, you know had uses it herself for, for health reasons and it's been huge in Ayurvedic medicine and of course it's this extraordinary color that's really why we know it what I did stumble across which absolutely delighted me was the lost spices the great um, herbs and flavors that our ancestors knew which have now disappeared forever and and I, so I made a little list of them and perhaps one day I'll try and seek them out there's something called Sylphium, of Cyr which appears in, in Latin and Greek authors again and again. And the Emperor Nero was said to have loved this, this gourmet, perfumed North African spice so much that he ate all of it. Was none left, but when Emperor, the Emperor Nero, the one who burnt down Rome, had finished. Um, perhaps it's the first plant that was rendered extinct by by human greed. And there are others, particularly from the Middle Ages, where we treasured spices in a different way, um, like zeodari and spikenard and hyssop and costus, huge in, in, um, in uh, uh, late medieval and, and, uh, and a sort of 18th century, 17th century recipes. But, but you know, who, where are they now? Who uses them? So I, I'm really determined to track down um, the Himalayan honeysuckle known as spikenard, which um, medieval cooks loved and even the Romans did. Lost spices, I think, and there may be a book in that. Thanks for listening. You can read the transcript to the show at jillysmith.com and click on podcasts. Please do get in touch on social media. I'm at Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith on Instagram. 
And that's where you can also follow my adventures in cookery as I spend the next six months at least online. Check the show notes and on Instagram for full details to get Cooking the Books discounts on Leith's cookery courses. And I'll see you next week for the new vegetarian voice and feeding force behind Ukrainian food writer Olya Hercules, Joe Woodhouse. 